Excellent. What a great day. So I think uh, we have a new, a new ploy for pulling people in from the hall, which is just to start a few minutes late. Uh, so um, thank you all for being here bright and early, 8.30 in the morning. It's another lovely day in Atlanta. Uh, it's got, we have a very, uh, a very busy uh, schedule this morning. So in the interest of you know, seeing stuff that's more interesting than me, uh, I'm going to move pretty quickly. I'd like to welcome everybody to Atlanta. I think we had uh, you know, a really fun time last night. It was you know, even slightly crazier than usual, uh, I'd say, in last night's demo session. So thanks, thanks to everybody who uh, worked so hard to put together a demo, who brought equipment, who brought your ideas. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I want to also say thank you to our hosts here at Georgia Tech. Um, a lot of people worked on uh, getting us together, but in particular, I want to say thanks to, uh, to Russ and to Sandy and to Don uh, for, for putting this together. It's a great event. Thank you. Uh, we also have a number of uh, sponsors, both uh, on campus and uh, local Atlanta businesses. Um, these folks are uh, you know, sponsoring uh, both uh, some of the refreshments last night, and you'll have the chance to speak with some of them uh, in this evening's uh, industry panel and reception. So that promises to be uh, really a, an interesting opportunity. I mean, Jeannie has been for a long time uh, engaged with industry in an attempt to uh, make sure that we're both transitioning the technology that we develop here um, to industrial partners and to make sure that we're listening uh, to industry uh, to hear about the, to the uh, research challenges uh, that, that they confront. And we'll have a little opportunity to do some more of that this evening. So I hope a lot of people will, will drop by. I'd like to introduce uh, two other people who are going to uh, welcome us here. Uh, Ron Hutchins, who's our uh, welcome speaker from uh, Georgia Tech. Ron is uh, the CTO here, uh, an associate vice provost, and a, a longtime uh, friend of Jeannie. And uh, after Ron, uh, Brian Lyles uh, from the NSF, also a longtime friend of Jeannie and, and our sponsor, uh, will we'll say a welcome and will uh, offer some friendly advice on a couple of topics of interest. Um, so, uh, Ron? You want this one or? It's, it's, it's great to be here with uh, so many of my, my friends who I've known for many, many years. Uh, it's, a, it's fun to welcome friends to my hometown and uh, have you here, so thanks for coming. You know, when you land at the airport, I don't know if they still do it at the Atlanta airport, as you're going up the escalators, the woman says, welcome to Atlanta. Well, that voice gets tiring after a while. I've forgotten if she still does it or not, but I'm going to offer my welcome to Atlanta as well. Um, you know, Atlanta is an interesting city. Atlanta... Uh, has been a hub for many years. I mean, I guess the Chattahoochee River is one of the reasons, but the, uh, the Cherokee Indians had Atlanta as one of their hubs. The Buffalo Trails ran through Atlanta and the Indians were here. Uh, the, uh, the Pony Express and the wagon trains went through here in Atlanta, and it has been a natural hub for those things for many years at the bottom of the Appalachian Mountains. The, uh, the Bell South back in the 60s and the 70s uh, and, and the 80s, I guess, claimed to be running fiber optic cable at 60 miles an hour, installing fiber optic cable into the ground, which is always interesting when the, the telephone company is, is going that fast. Um, we have things in, in, in downtown. You, you saw the Colo Atlanta was one of our sponsors. They're at 55 Marietta Street, across the street, uh, 56 Marietta Street. 56 Marietta Street was the Western Union building here in Atlanta uh, back a long time ago. When 56 uh, Street Partners uh, bought it out, they were going to turn it into a set of lofts, loft apartments. And I think a GTE at the time convinced them to create this thing called a, uh, a carrier neutral colo facility. And um, Mark, the owner, said, well, what's that? And so they hired a person to come in and created one of the top colo facilities in the southeast at 56 Marietta. 55 Marietta was across the street, uh, has been a hub for a long time. It's on the railroad tracks. So highways, railroad tracks, and rivers are, have been the main carriers for a long time. Now the fiber optic cable, of course, uh, follows those routes. 
Georgia Tech has a long history in networking. Glenn Reichert is here, uh, one of the principals in Surinet. How long ago was that, Glenn? Too long. Too long. And Georgia Tech partnered with the University of Maryland for Surinet. We had an NSF net node here for a while. And um, after Surinet became part of the uh, global internet um, in the southeast, we created a regional network called Southern Crossroads, SOX. SOX has served the four or five or six states in the southeastern region for uh, more than 15 years now. So we have a history of networking as well. And in fact, SOX has been one of the players with Russ Clark and uh, Nick Feimster uh, in the Genie world. We have a Genie rack at SOX, we have a Genie rack at Georgia Tech, and I'm very proud that Georgia Tech has been participating there and have tried really hard to make SOX a key element of the Genie infrastructure because I think the regional networks have to be a part of this in order to make it work. I'm very pleased that Internet2 and uh, ESNet have opted to put out uh, SDN infrastructure and we're happy to partner with them. We'll see more of that later on today, I believe. Um, there's a new project that we're initiating that I want to put on the table for you. I would love your ideas and your thoughts about it. I don't have a slide, but uh, across the street from here, about a block down, is a, an empty spot that we're going to be building a new facility on. And the facility is going to be a combination of a, of a data, data center and an office tower. And every time I say this, people say, what in the world are you doing building a data center in downtown Atlanta? Well, the notion is to do something different, to tie a data center to an office tower and build a living laboratory for things like taking waste heat out of the data center, feeding the office tower, uh, building an ecosystem where we take information technology as both a component of sustainability, in fact, using the analytics capabilities to uh, keep the office tower uh, working um, effortlessly and efficiently, but also extend that capability out into the Midtown Atlanta area and build an entire city um, community with IT as air and water. And in fact, taking that notion and extending it further to where we're uh, consuming the waste products, we're consuming the waste heat. If we use fuel cells, we'll take the carbon dioxide from the fuel cells and consume that. There's probably some uh, small um, beverage bottling company nearby here that could use the uh, carbon dioxide. So if we take the things that we produce and we consume them, we produce them locally, we consume them locally, what can we do in uh, sustainability for information technology? So that's the project we're working on now. I believe SDN is going to be a key component of that in the data center and in the network that goes out to the community. So I'm interested in your ideas for that as well. Just to close, um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. I've been spending the last, this semester in uh, Metz, France at our campus there. I've been teaching two courses, graduate networks and uh, mobile applications. Um, it's been more than 20 years since I taught graduate networks here at Georgia Tech. And to take the, the uh, details of networking that I taught 20 years ago and offer them up to a new crop of students who are brilliant and uh, don't have the boundaries that we've put up and to throw things at them like SDN uh, using Mininet with the open flow uh, parts of it and watching them take the same concepts that I taught 20 years ago and implementing them and Mininet using SDN te technologies is really interesting. Uh, they don't seem to have the same boundaries that we have and I believe the next generation of folks are gonna take uh, these new tools that we're putting up and it'll be like my kids don't know that there was never such a thing as uh, color TV or you know, computer games didn't always exist, or the uh, smartphone is only six or seven years old. So I'm excited to see what the future holds, and again, I think the folks here in this room are creating that future, and I'll send you my appreciation and thanks. So let's welcome Brian to speak to us. Good morning. On behalf of NSF, welcome to the uh, 19th GEC. It's hard to believe that we've that this is the 19th, um, and w uh, what a wonderful crowd out here! Uh, uh, we have uh, you know, a what is it? Uh, what's our registration? 200 and 230. Okay, very very good, and uh, I'm excited to see all of you and the work that's going on. Uh, we've got a couple of people we want to thank. Uh, Russ, uh, Russ Clark, stand up please, Russ. Uh, <laughs> as, 
as many of you know, uh, in the process of ensuring that uh, the GINI process is transitioning to the community, NSF handed off the task of organizing these uh, uh, to uh, the universities who host them. And uh, Russ has been our PI for this one, and uh, what a wonderful job. Now, there's also a group of folk here uh, who have uh, uh, served uh, in helping getting this, this done. Uh, I understand that there are a bunch of grad students in this room who have helped with the uh, organizing and uh, events. Will you all please stand up? Are they all sleeping in, Russ? <laughs> ah, okay. As you know, it's a time-honored tradition uh, for faculty members to, to hand work off to the grad students, and in this case, uh, they've done so. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. This has uh, been, uh, been a great GEC thus far, and I'm looking forward to the next uh, day and a half. So I've got uh, two points that I want to uh, make, um, one of which is an administrative point and the other is an opportunity which I recently became aware of that uh, many of you may be interested in but not know about. The first administrative point is that as you know, uh, we lost a little over a month this year with the, uh, the mess in DC. Uh, so things got pushed forward. Um, then, um, uh, and and things that would have been done in the fall are now being done in early winter, and things being done in early winter are being done in the spring. So our schedule is compressed. Uh, likewise, after 30 years, NSF is replacing its financial system. And that switch over to the new financial system is going to occur at the fiscal year boundary, which uh, is... Uh, the fiscal year uh, starts October 1st, and so they're shutting uh, the systems down uh, before October 1st and bringing up the new system sometime after October 1st. That means our closeout, the last date when we can get proposals uh, uh, recommended for funding and down to grants, has been moved up by a week. The combination of the two of these uh, is going to stress the system, uh, especially when it comes to overdue reports. So here's the listen up. Uh, we regularly have to chase you for overdue reports when it comes time for funding, either because your overdue report is blocking your funding or because it's blocking uh, the funding of one of your co-PIs and uh, very good friends, presumably. So I want you to repeat after me, I will turn my reports in on time this year and not when they're overdue. Uh, uh, we're, we're, it's simply uh, going to be a stressful situation at the uh, end of the fiscal, uh, as we get toward the end of the fiscal year and chasing after people to get their reports in is going to be very difficult. Uh, so please, please, please get your reports in. The opportunity is the IRES program. I know that many of you are working uh, with colleagues uh, in other countries. Uh, uh, the office, uh, the uh, uh, international office at NSF has a program uh, where you can get funding for three years to send three successive cohorts of your students to, your, uh, to a, a lab or a facility uh, uh, in another country, uh, and if you've got a, uh, a, a collaborator uh, abroad and uh, there's a value uh, assigned to sending your graduate or undergraduate students uh, to that lab, uh, uh, you need to go look at the uh, solicitation for IRES. Uh, it's due uh, end of the summer. Uh, so it'll be funded, in, it would be funded in FY15. Uh, uh, the restriction is, is that the students need to be uh, U.S. citizens, permanent residents. So um, uh, 
if, if this is at all interesting to you, please go take a look at it. I recently became aware of it and think it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, some of this community. And with that, thank you. Oh, good. So as I said, we've got a very busy uh, day today, which is, I think, a reflection of a very active uh, GEC. So I'm going to pretty quickly uh, sample a lot of the exciting things that are going on this week and give everybody a sense of where we are in the progress of Genie, because this is a particularly exciting time. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Vic and Heidi and Marshall uh, from the GPO to come up and drill in a little bit more on some of the details. Um, and Eric Boyd from Internet2 is going to give us an update on some of the work that's being done in Internet2 uh, to support uh, some basic Genie capabilities. Uh, we're really relying on these guys, so it's, it's great to have a chance to hear from Eric. We've then set aside about half of this morning's time to see a, a little bit of a glimpse into the future. Uh, we have a demonstration put together of a very preliminary SDX, Software Defined Networking Exchange capability, and we're going to look at that. We're going to talk a little bit about um, SDN, SDX, SDI, and we will provide at least a little bit of a decoder ring because I realize we are uh, plunging very deep into acronym soup there. Uh, so these are some glimpses of things that are promises that Genie is making for the future. Uh, Genie is beginning to hint at some very, some very new ideas here, and we'd like to give you guys a, a picture of that. I do want to take a second and introduce our other uh, guest speakers for today. I always already mentioned um, that Eric will be speaking about uh, the work happening at Internet2 in support of Genie and some of their other projects. Um, Mike Zink. Uh, from UMass will be giving uh, the Software Defined Networking Exchange, the SDX uh, demo, uh, and in particular uh, looking at the application side there. Uh, Mike's work is in uh, weather forecasting in the cloud, so that'll be very interesting stuff. And uh, Larry Landweber, who many of you may know, uh, will be joining us to talk a little bit about the, the future promise of Software Defined Infrastructure. So I said there was a lot going on this week. Uh, we always have some co-located events at GECs, and these are a wonderful opportunity for us to work with uh, projects that are our friends. Uh, this week is particularly stacked with them, and I'd like to give a little bit of a tour uh, for people who are trying to figure out what else is going on uh, while you're here. So thanks very much to the people from the various uh, uh, projects who, are, who have co-located uh, for A, for working with us, and B, for uh, giving me a little bit of a report so I could make it to, to everybody here. So yesterday, um, there was a, a meeting of the Open Grid Forum uh, working on the NSI, the Network Service Interface uh, Protocol. And for anybody who's been you know, beginning to experiment with Genie stitching and looking at the, you know, the connectivity over uh, wide area networks, uh, this should be a topic of particular interest uh, because uh, NSI is a framework for doing exactly this sort of work um, and standardizing it on an international level. So this meeting was Monday. There is a uh, protocol version 2 uh, out for public comment. The URL is up here. Uh, people who have an interest may want to take a look and get back to these folks. Uh, this is very tightly linked to you know, another meeting that's happening uh, later this week of the, the glyph techs, and there are a bunch of relevant presentations happening uh, later on this week. So for those who wish to tune in, uh, feel free. So that's one is the, the NSI uh, meeting. Starting tomorrow afternoon will be the third uh, Genie 
Research and Educational Experiment Workshop, the third GREE. Uh, we, are, we will have 18 papers this time. It's a combination of uh, full, short, and work in progress papers on a pretty wide variety of research and educational topics. Uh, there's an open flow tutorial, there's an SDN research panel. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Ada speaking as a, a keynote. Uh, so this promises to be a, a really fun session. Uh, we have a lot of exciting young researchers reporting on the work that they're doing with Genie. So that is Wednesday afternoon and Thursday. Also beginning Wednesday afternoon, but extending into Friday, is a, another uh, workshop that's uh, our friends at the Global Knock at Internet2 at uh, Indiana at ESNet uh, have been putting together. This is on operating innovative networks. So for people who are uh, in the business of operating a network, wondering how do I uh, work the sorts of things that are required to uh, run Genie to uh, connect my uh, science DMZ, say, uh, and I know this will be particularly raw for people who are uh, just off of yesterday's uh, proposal deadline, but for people who have been working on uh, CCIIE proposals and are wondering, well, what, you know, what, how do I do this? This is a, an excellent training opportunity. So I'm, I'm not sure, is this one actually full at this point, the one on Wednesday? No, okay, so there, there are some opportunities, so if you would like to uh, sign up, you still can. And uh, the intent is to have more of these going forward uh, with uh, the goal of the next one being uh, in July in Oregon. So if there are people who you know, just put in a proposal and don't quite have the energy to do this uh, tomorrow but would like to do it in a month or two, uh, please keep your eye out for that opportunity. Finally, I mentioned that the Glyph Techs are meeting uh, later this week, so that's also beginning uh, tomorrow. For those who aren't familiar with the Glyph, uh, the, Glam the Global Lambda Integrated Facility, it's a worldwide consortium of people pooling uh, light paths, and the Glyph Techs is a, one of their working groups. This is their agenda for tomorrow, and people who are at GEC are invited to come by and uh, participate in the Glyph Text meeting. Uh, I had a lot of, this is you know, tightly related to some of the NSI work, and I had a lot of positive feedback uh, from the NSI folks about uh, the excellent questions that the, uh, the Genie crew uh, brought into that meeting. So it's a good opportunity to participate. Okay, so we do have a lot of stuff going on that is you know, co-located with Genie. Please take the opportunity to see some of these things. I now want to come back and, and focus on what's going on you know, internally inside the, the Gini program. This is a very exciting time for us. There's really a, an extraordinary convergence of interesting and important activity, and a lot of the, the promise of Gini is becoming more and more real for more and more experimenters you know, right now over these couple of months. There's you know, continuing to see, we're continuing to see very rapid growth um, in our experimenter community in our educational applications. If you've been watching the map or watching the Genie portal, you've been noticing that racks are coming online very quickly now. If you've been experimenting with stitching, you're discovering that new connectivity options that are much of the promise of Genie are becoming available. Now there's still a fair number of kinks. Um, stitching is not completely smooth, but you know, it, is, it is happening and it is real. And there's a lot of activity going on with our international partners. A lot of federation interoperation and definition of uh, shared APIs. So we're going to touch very quickly on some of those. The main message here is this is a great time to be involved in Genie, And this is a good time to use your involvement in Genie to shape the future of networking, networking research, distributed computing research, and really shared computational and, and networking infrastructure. So I need to put up this uh, set of graphs at, at every GEC uh, because it, it continues to amaze me. This is the uh, continued uptake of experimenters. Uh, is this visible? Oh good, it's visible on this screen. It's not terribly visible on mine. Uh, but you know, check the hockey stick. Okay? This is uh, 1,800 cumulative users. So this is anybody who's uh, unique people who've ever created a sliver in Gini has crossed 1,800. And this graph down bottom is roughly speaking the uh, active set of users. These are people who created 
um, a sliver since the last GEC, and you'll see there are 700 plus such people. So these are not people who sort of you know, came in UGE once and disappeared. This is you know, a, a building community, which is very exciting. Now that comes with growing pains. Okay, this is very rapid growth, and there are some issues we're starting to see that we're working to resolve. Certain resources are turning out to be scarce. These tend to include uh, things like the VLANs available for stitching, um, in some cases, uh, rack occupancy, and uh, bare metal compute nodes. The rack occupancy, I think, is a particularly interesting example because it is probably not a real problem of shortage of resources. It's probably a problem of keeping experimenters informed. So we had a recent uh, time when one of our racks more or less filled up, and I think it was uh, Nick Bastin who just grabbed a set of statistics and mailed them out and said, look, you know, here's, here are where the empty racks are. And people you know, quickly scurried over there. Now, we are building uh, a set of monitoring tools. If you come by the uh, monitoring session uh, later on, you will, you know, you'll, you'll hear about them. So these, these are not surprises to us. We've learned these lessons uh, from our long collaboration with Planet Lab. And you know, one of the things Planet Lab folks learned very early on is you need to know where to go to find the best resources. Uh, so there's, a, there's partly a tooling problem, there's partly a genuine resource, resource uh, issue, and there's partly a keeping experimenters informed problem. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on the negative side of this because you know, these graphs are so, <laughs> are, are so exciting. I mean, it's really great to see hundreds and hundreds of people coming every GEC uh, to use Genie. The rack deployment is progressing at an amazing pace. Uh, the last two racks in the initial deployment are uh, in the ordering process, I think, Heidi, but not technically ordered yet. Is that? Yeah, okay. So, but we are really, you know, we're down to the last few, and they're coming online quickly. If you go to the portal, well, if you we went to the portal what, uh, a couple of days ago when I went, you would have seen uh, 22 racks. I don't think that number's changed since then, uh, but it, it does change rapidly these days. We also have a, a bit of an announcement of a, a new flavor of Genie Rack. Uh, so one of our commercial partners, uh, Dell, has been working closely with one of our academic partners, Clemson, and they've implemented the first instance of a, of a specific new type of Genie Rack, which they're calling Open Genie. Uh, this uh, rack is currently running at Clemson. Uh, it runs Dell hardware, uh, the Gram open source aggregate manager, um, and is uh, deployed to Clemson, there's a clone at GPO uh, for testing. The standalone testing is complete, but we're still uh, working on the uh, data plane and, and stitching aspects, which we expect to uh, wrap up testing sometime pretty soon. Uh, and at that point, we'll make the rack available for experimenter use. Uh, this is the uh, system specification for uh, uh, the rack, but you'll see it's uh, a relative, I think the most exciting bullets here are down bottom. Uh, Dell is you know, offering this rack as an orderable item with a single SKU for um, several different ranges of uh, populating uh, the servers in the rack so you can uh, buy a little low, low, medium, and high grade rack. So this is a, this is a very exciting uh, prospect to see uh, a major, uh, a major vendor like Dell picking this up and, and really making an offer of a, of a Genie rack. This uh, makes it our third uh, source for uh, ready and convenient uh, ordering of Genie racks. So this is a great development. Uh, stand by for the Clemson rack and, and come try it out. Genie WiMAX uh, continues to support a, a broad range of research. We have 13 uh, sites, 26 base stations, uh, using both uh, commodity, uh, standard commodity uh, handsets and uh, the uh, yellow nodes that we put together for uh, supporting uh, research on campuses. We had a meeting uh, yesterday when we began to ask the question of, well, what, what do we do next here? And we're looking at uh, a number of options, but we'd like to start to do the work of transitioning uh, 
from WiMAX towards an LTE uh, environment. WiMAX is probably not the right horse to be riding uh, long into the future. Uh, and we are seeing some of our commercial partners uh, transitioning to LTE deployments. We'd like to move with them. We'd also like to broaden uh, the set of sites where uh, Genie wireless research infrastructure is available. Uh, this is still a work in progress. Uh, this is simply a candidate uh, deployment drawn here on this map, but we're trying to work on moving this forward. I think one of the reasons why you see the dramatic uptick in Gini usage recently is because we've started to talk a lot more about stitching, about building layer two wide area configurations that are configurable on experimenter demand. This is you know, very much at the core of Genie's long-term promise. We have just over the past few months gotten to the point where this is regularly available to experimenters. We are working very quickly to expand the size of the Genie stitching mesh so that more topology opportunities are available to more people. At the current time, we've got a dozen Genie racks incorporated in the mesh, but we're not gonna rest until we get them all. <laughs> this is, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to uh, support stitching to uh, every Genie rack, and we're, we're working at it madly. Now for those who've been playing with this, and who, for those who sat in the, uh, uh, the stitching tutorial, uh, you've seen there's initial tooling here. You really can uh, build stitched configurations relatively straightforwardly uh, from your own desk, uh, but there's still a fair number of limitations. As I said before, the VLANs that we're using for stitching remain a limited resource. Uh, we need to expand that set and manage it a bit better. And the tool support really needs some uh, reliability and usability improvements. Uh, we're asking for you know, both your interest and your patience. Please use these capabilities, but if you find them challenging, please ask for help. We are working on addressing a lot of these limitations through a combination of expanded resources and better tools. This is the same thing in report card form. We are now in quite good shape, I believe, for uh, supporting lots of different sorts of connectivity and deep programmability options, including uh, software switching, software-based uh, open flow switching, and hardware open flow switching um, in single site configurations. We are progressing in multi-site stitched configurations and we have some work to do in getting ourselves weaned off the original uh, Genie mesoscale uh, system for bringing uh, hardware open flow control to wide area stitched configurations. All of this is work that's underway and we expect to see major progress. We've been doing a lot of work in our international federation activities. If you were at uh, the demo night last night and you stopped by uh, Brecht's poster, you would have seen a, a demonstration of the uh, International Federation API for uh, clearinghouse functions, the CH API. It's now supported at multiple clearinghouses and you know, is, uh, running in, uh, is running joint, running, uh, sorry, running continuous joint EU-US tests. So this is a, you know, continues to develop. We're also working on the Federation Aggregate Manager API, so for reserving resources as well, the FAA. If you would like to participate in this discussion, you're certainly welcome to come by on Wednesday uh, for the coding sprint. That's one of our topics there. Related to US-EU collaboration, and then I promise I will stop uh, and let the, uh, the folks who uh, can provide more of the details, come up and talk. This is another funding opportunity that people should be aware of. This is a relatively uh, quick and simple uh, funding opportunity for people who are collaborating US, EU, Genie Fire collaborations, essentially. So the GPO has modest funding available to cover just travel and living expenses, but that's often the hardest part for US researchers to go visit your collaborators on who are doing fire research in the EU. Now the emphasis here is on funding younger folks, students, postdocs, pre-tenured faculty. And the requirements are that you, in fact, are collaborating with someone 
in the EU, that you're working in the future internet area, uh, and that you are affiliated with a, a US college or university. We are currently accepting proposals at this address, geniesavvyproposals at bbn.com. Please send in your proposals soon. Six folks have already been funded, and you know, we'll keep accepting proposals until we run out of money. Uh, if you were intrigued by Brian's mention of the IRIS program, uh, this is a, a lightweight opportunity to maybe make a quick visit uh, this spring, this summer, and lay the groundwork for something larger, uh, like an IRIS proposal. If you're not thinking of something that large, if it's just a good chance to go talk to uh, your colleagues in Europe, we can help you out with that too. I always close every, uh, every talk I give, basically, uh, by inviting folks to uh, come to the next GEC. This one's still well underway, uh, but our next one is in June uh, at UC Davis. We are organizing it uh, in conjunction with the second US Ignite Application Summit. So for those who are thinking of coming to the next GEC, you have a slightly more complicated planning uh, need than usual. You ought to think about uh, perhaps coming uh, to, the, uh, to the application summit immediately afterwards. If you have uh, questions about that, Glenn Reichert is front and center and can uh, fill you in on what's happening there. We'd be delighted to have you there, but we're planning both of these together. And just to make things a little bit more complex, we are unrolling, unveiling a slightly modified uh, GEC format in Davis. Uh, we're going to be spreading over four days with an emphasis on the first day being for uh, newcomers, for folks who really want to uh, emphasize their time at the uh, startup tutorials. So the format's gonna be a little bit different. We will talk about that and we will talk about potential future changes to GEC format, uh, both for the upcoming year or so and for kind of the uh, post large scale development of Genie era uh, that comes a couple of years out. So if people are interested in joining in that conversation, we have a brainstorming session uh, over lunch tomorrow afternoon. Thank you for your attention to this sort of whirlwind um, set of updates. Uh, Vic Thomas is gonna come up next and talk a bit more about uh, work he's doing in experimenter support and it's gonna take just an extra minute. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, good morning. Um, so I'm here to give a little update on what's happening with experiments and experimental support. Uh, so as Mark pointed out, there's been a tremendous growth in the number of people, uh, experimenters using Genie. Uh, just since the last GEC, we have had over 600 experimenters who have created over 180,000 slivers, slivers being resources you use in your experiment, virtual machines, links, and so on. So it's a very active, uh, experimenter community. There's also been a uh, great increase in the number of um, uh, instructors using Genie in their classroom. Just this semester, we have 13 classes using Genie, um, and uh, there are two classes from New York University, New York Poly using Genie, one for a wired networking class, one for a wired ne wireless networking class, and we have two um, classes in Europe uh, using Genie, one of them being um, Nikki's alma mater. The, um, there's also been a lot of training of experimenters that has happened since the last GEC. Um, kai Chi, Bing, and Yong organized a Genie winter camp early this year. So this team has organized summer camps the last two years and decided to try a winter camp this year when students are not in school and also not at internships. Uh, we had 16 participants, uh, one of whom was a faculty member. And this um, 
uh, and the participants broke into groups to do group projects. Uh, they, there were three group projects in the areas of non-IP routing, uh, WiMAX combined with distributed processing, Hadoop-based distributed processing, and um, one based on OpenFlow and uh, OpenFlow firewalls. It was a shorter, shorter camp than usual. It was a day shorter, but the projects were still quite impressive. It's, it, it, was, it was actually very impressive to see how much they did in, uh, on, their, on their projects in a day and a half. There will be a summer camp again this year in late May, early June. It will be hosted by Yonk at Iowa State University. Watch for announcements on the Genie Announce mailing list. There will be stipends available, as always, for people to attend and, and travel grants. So um, keep your eyes open for announcements. Uh, we also had um, a train the TAs uh, um, tutorial this spring. We tried this for the first time last fall. It was very successful. So we did it again this spring. Um, the, it, it was WebEx based and uh, was held over two Friday afternoons. The first session was uh, very much like the Getting Started with Genie series of uh, tutorials at the GEC, uh, a, a talk introducing Genie and a couple hands-on exercises. And the second session focused on the logistics and management of a class on Genie. So setting up of accounts, debugging student slices, and, the, and so on. There were 22 participants from 15 institutions, nine of whom were um, uh, faculty members. The next, uh, given the uh, popularity of this uh, tutorial, we will do it again in the fall. So again, keep your eyes open for an announcement on the um, Genie Announce mailing list. Something new this year was Train the Admin tutorial, modeled after the Train the TA. Like the Train the TA, where the session one was just getting introduced to Genie, get a feel for what it, what it is like to experiment with Genie. And session two was uh, more admin focused, so rack administration, form administration, uh, and so on. This was a very popular tutorial. We had 35 people sign up, and uh, so we had to break up session, two, uh, session one into uh, two groups. For session two, uh, 35 exceeded the capacity of our WebEx um, uh, account, so we had to use Google uh, Hangout on Air. It, it went very well, and um, this afternoon, there will be a more or less a repeat of session two that uh, Sarah will be doing um, after lunch. We continue to do Genie tutorials at conferences. Two weeks ago, uh, we did a tutorial at 6C, and last week there was one at the cloud computing conference. Uh, in, a, in a few weeks, we will be we have a poster and demo um, uh, session at uh, NSDI. And very exciting is a full day tutorial at SICOM in August. Um, the SICOM tutorial is going to be quite different from any tutorial we've done at other conferences. Uh, the emphasis will be on novel networking architectures, using Genie to build novel networking architectures. We have a hands-on tutorial by Peter Steenkist uh, of the XIA team, and, um, also another, and, and there will also be a hands-on tutorial based on the NDN F FIA project. Uh, there will be tutorials on, the, on wireless research on Genie, and, and uh, Ray will be um, doing a demo uh, and, and talk on, on the Mobility First project uh, on Genie. Um, so, um, and and th there'll also be tutorials on using uh, Genie, the, the hardware open floor resources in Genie. So very, we are very excited about it. If you will be going to SIGCOM, do check out this tutorial. In terms of community support, we have a new uh, mailing list a community supported mailing list for experimenters. So in the, we, we have mailing lists that are specific to certain kinds of resources, like the Protogenie users mailing list, the Orca users mailing list, and so on. The Genie users mailing list is, um, is a similar list, but it covers uh, topics that are not specific to a certain aggregate or a certain type of, res uh, of, of technology. Um, so we st this list started a few weeks after the last GEC, and we are at over a, over a hundred subs um, uh, subscribers, and it's uh, getting increasingly active. We also have an improved Genie.net, so if you haven't checked that out in the last week, 
um, go check it out. Uh, hopefully, it's easier to find information about Jeannie there. And then, um, finally, um, many, many of you have been asking what happened to my ankles, so to save you the rest from having to ask the question. A few weeks ago, I took an uncontrolled descent down a jagged incline that resulted in something like this, but I am getting better, so thank you. All right. Phone took an, uh, microphone took an uncontrolled descent down a jagged incline. Okay, great. <laughs> First milestone reached. I'm going to give a, a very brief update on Genie infrastructure and operations. There are a lot of references in these slides uh, to wiki pages. I'll be posting this right after the talk so you can go and look at the details um, for work that we've done at a lot of the sites. Uh, as you all know, we've been deploying Genie Racks. <laughs> you may remember uh, this map of places where we are working on deploying racks and places where we want to deploy more. Um, there are a set of requirements for sites who want to run Genie racks, and we've been having uh, very good success with getting uh, many campuses and regionals to uh, provide this uh, while they're running Genie racks. So that's been great. Um, this is the reminder diagram that a Genie rack has an IP control plane and a layer two data plane. Uh, and the, some, some IP experiments take advantage of both of those, but most of what Genie focuses on is layer two data plane. Um, and we've got 52 of these racks out there, either deployed or in some stage of progress of being deployed. That's not counting the couple that are waiting to be ordered still. Uh, if you want to look at the status for any individual rack, go to this link and look it up. Um, there's two kinds of racks, the production racks, which are our old pals Instagenie and Exogenie, and the provisional racks, which are the ones Mark mentioned, Dell and Cisco racks. The difference being that um, Dell and Cisco racks are on the network, but they're still in the process of being tested and put through the paces of making sure they conform with the rest of the Genie APIs and the way standard Genie racks are working. Um, so. Uh, available, but not necessarily something you want to use as an experimenter quite yet until we get through all that. Uh, if you're interested in looking up details about how any rack connects to the regional or Internet 2 or uh, any other networks, we have uh, wiki pages you can go to look at for that. Um, and we have detailed results of all of the confirmation tests. Um, GPO tests every single rack when it's deployed and often retest them later on when major things change. Uh, you can also crib RSpecs from these, so that's one of the most useful 
uh, things to be able to do. I think I can move this up a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Nope, that's worse. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, we hit a milestone in this last period. Uh, we delivered all the HP racks that were originally part of the Genie project. So that's 31 funded, and there were others delivered beyond that that were paid for by individual campuses. Um, and I'd like to recommend, uh, recognize the three HP people, HP people who were responsible for this. Uh, Nikki Watts is not here, but she coordinated a whole bunch of hard work with manufacturing and people at HP. Um, Jack Brassel, can you stand up? Uh, and Rick McGear, who's been with us since the beginning. So um, I'd like Jack and Rick to come up here, please. We'd like to uh, recognize the large amounts of time <laughs> that you invested in being able to get these genie racks up and shipped. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like you to bring this one back for Nikki. <laughs> and uh, it's important to notice that these are, are uh, not covered by a protective metal uh, <laughs> surrounding, which is the way uh, you guys were operating. Uh, out, out on the edges, but uh, working hard with Jeannie. So I'd like to thank you very much. <laughs> you. So it dreams very slowly, kind of like the delivery of the Jeannie ride. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, this is uh, not to make little of the work that the other rack teams have been doing. The Exogeny rack team has been working very hard and uh, wrangling their vendors as well. Um, there's a lot of other people on the Instageny team besides the HP uh, members. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this because it really was something that we worked long and hard to accomplish. So um, hopefully the rest of you can look forward to exciting gag awards in the future too. OK, back to real work. Um, one of the major things we did in network engineering in this past period was um, re-engineer the Genie network to accommodate the NLR shutdown. Uh, as you know, we had uh, NLR open flow switches in our mesoscale core. Those had to be uh, removed. Um, NLR was also in the process of adding more switches, so um, those had to be returned. And there was a lot of engineering that the rack teams and the site people had to do to uh, adjust for that. So. I really appreciate their efforts, and um, we were able to survive that transition without any real interruption in uh, Genie operations at most places. Um, we've also been working on the plan to migrate from the mesoscale onto the combination of regional and internet to uh, services that are now available through AL2S uh, and the OESS um, infrastructure that AL2S uh, works with. Um, and so we did additional testing on the cross connects that are currently in existing uh, between, basically between ION and AL2S allows you to interconnect the mesoscale with either racks that are deployed on AL2S or people who want to use AL2S. Uh, so we expect to be able to start doing um, stitching and monitoring of AL2S in the next period so that it'll be easier to um, phase out the mesoscale. Um, if you want to look at details of that, there's a wiki for that as well. Um, and one thing I wanted to highlight that uh, all of this we do with the regional providers, but a really interesting development lately has been the regional providers um, being interested in SDN exchanges. So uh, you probably uh, saw at the demos last night, there were some SDN exchange demos. Uh, and there's going to be a panel today in the operations session of people who are interested in doing SDN exchanges. Uh, and in particular, Starlight and uh, Georgia Tech uh, have been very active on that. So um, I encourage anybody who's interested in that to attend that panel. Um, as Mark mentioned, we've been working on stitching. Uh, we've seen 16,000 stitch slivers um, since November. Um, and we're working on an aggregate. Right now we do all our stitching through ION, but we'll have an aggregate to do it through OESS coming soon, along with monitoring. Uh, and if you want to see detail about any site whether it's in stitching or out of stitching, it could change any day, so go to this link. 
Uh, on the WiMAX side, Mark mentioned the overall picture for what we're doing. On the networking side of WiMAX, uh, we're really working with the 10 sites, um, seven of which have plans to do network connections to their racks. And we want to see the Genie network go all the way out to the base station and support the OMF tools for experimenters to make easy use of those sites that have um, WiMAX or in the future LTE. Um, there's a little bit of work to do packaging for that as well that's been ongoing to make it easier to duplicate software from site to site. Um, on the open flow side, uh, there was a lot of activity with plastic slices. Um, and the results from the last few runs of plastic slices have been graphed and correlated. So now you can look at some interesting views of traffic, uh, for example, by aggregate or by slice here. Um, plastic slices sets up experimentation automatically and reports on it semi-automatically with some help from Josh Smith. Um, and so these are just examples of a couple of types of um, iPerf tests for TCP and UDP that you can see um, at that, on the website links that are included. Uh, as usual, we keep track of the firmware and software that's deployed for, uh, approved by Genie for um, internetworking for OpenFlow. Uh, there was a new brocade release that's at Scenic and we're uh, continuing to work with Scenic and with Internet2 on future new brocade releases. Um, on the Flowvisor side, we're pretty much uh, stable at the version that we're at um, and looking at new um, opportunities for replacing Flowvisor, things that have been announced at ONF. Uh, on the Foam side, there was a new release to uh, address some bug fixes and packaging issues. On the OpenFlow side, we still have Tango Monitoring Foam, which is doing monitoring reporting to the GMOC, so that's active at the same time as the new monitoring that we're working on. Uh, and there's still an, an open flow controller available for people who are interested in running it, um, which is, uh, lets you use layer one information. Um, this is a workaround, uh, basically, but it's also interesting for certain types of experiments. Um, and that's available from the GPO if you're interested in running it, which some aggregates are. Uh, okay, so that's all the stuff that we had been working on for a long time. Uh, and now we're starting to work on new monitoring, uh, redesign, uh, and implementation and deployment. We're also working on, we have a lot of sites now who have admins and support staff who are helping us with Genie Racks. So doing tutorials and uh, improving our documentations for, for that is a priority. Um, I'm very happy to say that uh, we've seen the monitoring redesign go through uh, the design implementation and initial deployment stages at three different places in Internet 2, at the max aggregate, at an Instagenie rack and an Exogenie rack, um, and there are local data stores active in all those places. Um, that's a small number of places, but it's a huge amount of work. So we're finally getting to the point where uh, hopefully before the next GEC, you'll be able to look at an end-to-end -end path, tease out the Genie resources and the slices and slivers, and ask questions about how they're all related, uh, and do that very easily from some web-based tools. Um, so I'd really uh, like to thank all the people who worked on that, uh, both in the GPO and, and in the other aggregates that deployed it. Um, and there'll be a lot more discussion about it in the ops session if you want to hear more details. I just wanted to show a little preview because University of Kentucky joined this team. Um, they came up from nothing, so they literally had no involvement. Uh, the, the group that is doing the monitoring had no involvement in Genie before uh, this period between GECs. Uh, and they are now able to show a dashboard collector um, running and actually querying some data from those local data stores. Um, they've been working very closely with us, and they're going to continue doing that going forward. So I hope some of you had a chance to see their demo. Um, there's lots of other monitoring that the rack teams do, that experimenters do, that INM does, uh, and I'm not reporting on all that here. It's also very important, but I'm just reporting on the operations stuff that we put together because we see it as necessary to transfer Genie over to some other organization in a couple of years. So um, there's lots of other monitoring things going on if you're interested in that topic generally. Um, 
another thing I wanted to mention was the GMOC, which has been uh, active in monitoring all along. Uh, they completed a legal law enforcement and regulatory exercise during this period between GECs. Um, that's basically a long term that says, what if there's a legal problem or what if there's an emergency problem on the Genie network? How do you contact the people who can do something about that? How do you track it through and how do you make sure that you take the right actions before, um, before there might be a more serious problem? Uh, so uh, they'll be discussing that in the off session, the results from it, but basically it was a successful exercise and we intend to do it again. Um, we also have been taking advantage of that GMOC database that's still running to do uh, reporting, which there are links to here, uh, and also the GMOC uh, maintains tickets, does rack turnup tracking, um, all the things that you would expect a, an operations uh, organization spanning lots of different people cooperating to build a network doing. Um, so come to the ops session if you want to hear more about that. Um, what we're planning to do in the next period is really get this um, transition for operations going uh, where uh, instead of the early phases of Genie where the GPO and the GMOC were doing operations and um, getting lots of support from different aggregate owners and rack teams, we're now trying to more officially put in place a collaborative operations uh, organization. Um, so this is a, a challenge and something that I think is kind of unique to Genie because of the way uh, we deploy and support racks uh, and network infrastructure. Um, I put our explicit goals here. Um, we're going to be working on planning for this and if anybody else is interested in being involved who isn't already involved, um, please do let us know and show up at the op session and the coding sprint if you want to discuss in more detail. And that's it for the operation summary. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to um, follow up on a lot of what Heidi was saying in terms of stitching to to take the software perspective and talk about where we're where we've been, where we're at, and where we hope to be going in the near future. Uh, at Madison at GEC 17, we showed a first demonstration of the pieces of the automated Genie st uh, stitching tool suite. We we showed two different tools. There was stitching. Stitcher.py, which manages the allocations and does all the sort of negotiations with, G with each of the aggregates and you know, loops and retries and, and has error checking and, and so on. And the SCS, the Stitching Computation Service, which takes a, a simple R spec, which says, I want to stitch from this point to this point, and calculates all the intermediate hops that, and expands the R spec. The current approach towards stitching is, is fundamentally unchanged. This is still the foundation. That, that we're using for the um, experimenter-facing Genie stitching services. We had a tutorial session yesterday which showed how to use this and the, the session was successful and this is, this is how we intend for, for stitching to go in the, uh, in the, in the present and in the, uh, in the foreseeable future for allocating inter-aggregate topologies. There have been some, since GC17, we've done a lot of trying to, uh, to shake out shake out the, the performance and shake out the bugs with these two services. Um, in the beginning, Stitcher.py was, was very verbose. We've, we've had much more uh, friendly and, and filtered uh, output for the logging. A lot more uh, extensive error handling and retrying so that it is much more likely in the, in the case of, of um, trying to go to a particular resource that it, that it fails, that it will retry so that your chances of, of getting a successful, um, a successful stitch topology is much greater. There's been a lot of bugs and we've shaken out a lot. 
Um, this is all proportional to the number of people that tried the try stitching and identified these problems. So you know, this is an ongoing process and I would say a collaborative process between you, the users of these services, and, and we, the people who are trying to identify problems and fixing them. Um, Heidi mentioned that there are a lot more stitchable resources than there were back at GEC 17, and these are all represented um, available for stitching, and they're available in the SCS, so that you know, when you say, I want to go from here to there, the various points, I can, there are a far greater set of uh, stitchable topologies and, and paths that are available than there were before. Um, and there's been a lot of tutorial work and a lot of documentation work to make the stitching process uh, easier to understand, easier to perform, so that you can understand what the output of stitcher is and, and um, you know, what it means when, when something goes wrong. So I'd like to talk about a couple of, of things, uh, the directions that we're pointing in the future. We expect that more of the experimenter-facing tools, for example, the Genie Portal, the Genie Desktop, JAX, which is the, the new replacement for Plaque, will be supporting the allocation of interaggregate topologies so that, so that a lot of the work that's done by Stitcher and SCS will be hidden from the experiment and you'll be able to, to do things using um, graphical interfaces and user gestures rather than uh, uh, purely desktop kinds of, kinds of operations. Um, they may or may not use Stitcher.py and SCS as a foundation. Some will, some won't, that's sort of uh, up to the tool. We're exploring a capability to enable stitching to an aggregate, to, to, a, to an aggregate itself as opposed to an interface. This will provide something like a multi-point um, provision rather than the exclusive exclusive point-to-point -point connections that are available now. Um, this will it, it'll allow it experiments to stitch to one data path to possibly more than one endpoint. So we think that that'll be an interesting and, um, and helpful extension to the capability that we have now. Um, I want to advocate strongly, and this is something that, that you'll be hearing a lot at the developer sessions, that uh, one of the real bottlenecks that we have in the performance of stitching is that we don't have the two-phase commit available at a lot of the aggregates. The, the two-phase commit that's available by, from AMAPI v3 that has, allows you to allocate things, which is a relatively cheap operation, and then provision them, which is a relatively expensive operation. Once we have that widely adopted, a lot of the bottleneck in the performance of VLAN negotiation that happens across aggregates uh, and across the, uh, the various stitch points on the hops will be greatly improved. Uh, I think the next big challenge that's going to be happening uh, in, in stitching infrastructure and the tooling to support stitching infrastructure is open flow, open flow control of stitch topologies. And we'll be talking some about this in the, in the session towards the programmable WAN uh, later this afternoon. So my, my uh, takeaway message here is Genie stitching is open for experimental use. It's been open for a while. We've expanded considerably the number of, the number of points that you, can, um, that you can stitch together and the tooling and the, uh, the tutorial and documentation supports that you can understand how to do it better. Um, there still is a lot of growth, room for growth, room for, op room for improvement, and to be frank, you can expect that there will be problems. There will be bumps along the road. We need you to try this out, to push it, to help us identify the, uh, the problems, where we need to be focusing our efforts to fix them. Uh, it's the demand for the services that's going to help us to continue to make the, these capabilities grow and improve. So please, dive in, have at it, and uh, you know, keep us in the loop, and we'll, we'll make stitcher, stitching a more successful and satisfying experience um, in the next in the, in the coming months. Thank you. So Heidi mentioned that we've built our uh, stitching service on top of uh, essentially on top of Internet 2's ION service. Um, Eric is going to give us a bit of an update on what's going on uh, in Internet 2 that's going to make uh, those capabilities a lot more extensible and flexible and uh, bring us some new options in Genie Stitching and elsewhere. Have I stalled sufficiently? Yes. Okay.
There we go. Hi, I'm Eric Boyd for, from Internet2, um, Senior Director for Strategic Projects in the Network Services Group. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Genie community for quite some time now. Um, so I'm going give, to give a quick overview. I'll also be talking um, this afternoon um, in the session that uh, Marshall mentioned. Um, so if there's questions or discussion, that's probably the best time to have that, but just to try to get through this quick. Um, and not take too much time. So basically, I want to sort of talk about um, what we're doing to enable innovations, particularly for the, for the Genie community. Um, for those of you, I think everybody knows this, but just to make sure we're on a level set, you know, Internet2 is a nonprofit. We run a national network that links all the universities in the country together. It's the basic reason why we're here and why we do what we do. I like to think of um, this, some of you may not know, um, Internet 2's original name and still sort of our correct alternate name is UCAID, which stands for University Corporation for Advanced Internet Development. And I like to think of that as a mission statement for Internet 2. You know, our primary um, shareholders, owners, et cetera, are the university presidents of the major research universities. You know, we get most of our direct feedback from the CIOs of the major research universities, and, and, and we really exist to serve them. So it's a nonprofit to serve the needs of the university community. And that includes the network research community. Um, and sort of the reason I think of this as a mission statement is we're really here to do two things. One is we are here to provide production networking that's rock solid, that you can rely on, that connects the universities together. And the other is to advance the state of, of networking. If all we're doing is being a commodity provider, we really shouldn't exist. So we have to do both. Um, so basically, we need to be able to support Genie, and we need to be able to not break Facebook, is a, maybe a simple way to think about it. Um, so Internet2 has been focused for the last couple of years on its innovation program. Um, and and it, this, this affects both how we implement our own network and sort of what we're encouraging the larger Internet2 community to do. Um, and, and Dave Lambert, our CEO, laid out two pieces, um, or, or, or sort of a, a basic definition of what that innovation environment is. Abundant bandwidth, opening up the network stack, and sort of friction-free science, basically creating an environment where university researchers can get their hands dirty again like they could in the 90s and tear apart the boxes and do things differently, where um, there's no constraints on how much bandwidth you can shove through the network, and where we do everything possible to enable large data flows that are necessary for today's big science. Um, translated into concrete terms, that means, at least for now, we're trying to get campuses to move to 100 gig networking to embrace software-defined networking and science DMZs. And the nice thing is those three things line up well with uh, the NSF CCNIE or CCIIE program that I know many universities, yours included, have been applying for and getting good grants to do this sort of thing. So, you know, the innovation can happen on the national backbone, and that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. But probably the most important innovation is that that happens in the campus and regional networks. Um, and, you know, programs like Genie encourage that. So we're trying to create an innovation platform across Internet2. Um, for about a year and a half, we've been running a 100 gig network um, and trying to make it available to do whatever innovative things you want to do. And I think we've made a lot of progress towards that end. Um, so specifically, this is supposed to sort of show the idea of multiple virtual networks over a physical network. You know, if you think of um, VMs as something that we all know and love, or at least at the system administrator level we do, um, as a way that you know, has totally transformed how people do computing and how they organize their server farms and everything. You know, in some sense, we're trying to do the same thing for networks. Um, so we have a 100 gig nationwide backbone. Um, we've got native open flow. We're in progress of putting in virtual slices, which is what I'll talk about. We deliberately went for a multi-vendor environment to, to encourage interoperability. Um, it's connected to all the major public peering points, and we've got over a year of solid production experience. Um, and um, it basically allows you to link, you know, all the places you might want to get. So what does that network look like? So we've got layer one, layer two, and layer three. This is the current map of the layer two network. Um, for those of you who take detailed notes, you'll notice that the number of red dots keeps growing. I think it's upwards of 30 here. And hopefully you'll see your regional network on this list as someone is connected into it. Uh, basically, this number keeps growing very quickly and more and more folks are getting connected into this. What I didn't show on this slide is we're actually running our entire Layer 3 network over this as well. Um, so uh, where it used to be that we ran our Layer 3 network over a separate 
10 gig network and directly connected the routers, now they're all running over these layer two VLANs. So from a logical perspective, all of our routers are uh, adjacent to each other now. We have a full mesh of VLANs between them. Does this create a platform for innovation? We hope so. Um, does it encourage programmability? We hope so. The whole thing is running over SDN. It's uh, specifically OpenFlow 1.0. It's not in hybrid mode. I, I, I really just said that the national network at layer three is running over our layer two network. The layer two network is running over an SDN substrate running in OpenFlow 1.0 mode and not hybrid mode. So that's been true for the layer three part of it for several months now. The whole system has existed for about a year and a half. So does this create a platform for innovation? We hope it's starting to, but I just grew the definition from what I said Dave talked about um, in, in his early slides. You know, we wanna add virtualization and we wanna integrate the network with compute and storage. So we're right now we're focused mostly on the virtualization aspect. So what software stack are we using to build that? And this is a new version of something I've shown here previously, but hopefully it clears up some of the problems and, and goes into the details. Um, if you ignore flow space firewall there for a moment, over on the right hand side, we've got OESS. That allows us to, it's, a, it's our first application. It speaks OpenFlow out the back end. It's got the Knox controller hidden inside of it, although we can replace that controller. Um, it has multiple APIs going upwards. It has a UI some of you might use. Um, it has a foam aggregate manager. Um, you can program directly to the API. You can use the Oscars API, which I know at least one project here is doing. Um, and when um, the NSI extension to Oscars is available, we'll put that on there as well. And then from an east-west perspective, it uses Oscars currently to speak to IDC protocol, but it'll also, when the NSI extension is available, speak that as well. So my guess, and I'm making these numbers up, is that for most network researchers, what you care about is a VLAN. Uh, you want to connect two Genie racks with a VLAN. Um, you know, maybe that's 90% of you. Uh, you want to connect from your campus into the Genie mesoscale. Or you have another job besides supporting Genie, as surprising as that might be, where you want to peer between two regionals. You want to you know, set up a virtual network for your physics folks. All those things, the VLAN service will work, and that should be plenty. There is a small percentage of you, though, who I think probably think that uh, you have a better way to do networking, and you want to show the world that that works. And you may have simulated it on a, on a mini-net environment or whatever. Um, but you really want to take it to the production level. And so we want to, you know, we, we, if you asked us to go build you another $100 million network so you could try out your idea, unfortunately, we would probably say no. Um, but we would like to say yes to that question. How do we build you a national network with 15,000 route miles, 100 gig, 30 plus nodes, the whole thing, and let you have a control over it? We want to create that environment for you. And so what we've been looking at is something called flow space firewall. So originally we looked at Flowvisor, which I think almost everybody in this room is probably familiar with. And um, we've given previous talks talking about some of the challenges we ran into trying to look at it. It's a great idea. Um, it didn't scale for our application. So we came up with a definition of virtualization, network virtualization, that's pretty simple and tried to build a very simple second generation tool that would allow us to do that. And that's Flow Space Firewall. And specifically, Flow Space Firewall has two basic functions. It's a VLAN slicer and a resource protector, and that's really all it is. So the idea is that we want to give VLAN, say, 2,000 to 4,000 to our um, production environment. And so it will be able to stick rules into the switches, the production environment will, as long as it stays in that VLAN range. Likewise, we want to be able to have one of you come to us and say, I've got uh, an idea for a great new controller. My controller uses the northern route in the summer and the southern route in the winter, or something like that, or you know, depending on whether it's cloudy or not. Whatever you want to do that is your idea how to do networking better. And so we want to be able to give you a VLAN range, like 100 to 200, and say, as long as you don't give us rules outside of that, we'll let them into the network, and you will actually put them in real switches. So these are not simulated. We're trying to make it actually in the real switches that are also running that production stack which, just to point out again, has all our layer two services and has the national layer three network as well. So obviously we're being cautious. So the first step towards doing that, um, we did two weeks ago at the Open Networking Summit. Um, try to finish up here quick. Um, we did two weeks ago at the Open Networking Summit. We worked with the folks from ON Lab. Um, they've got their idea on how to do this with ONOS and Open Vertex. And so on a, on a 10 gig separate network we call NDDI that we've been using to test this out, 
we put the whole production stack in one slice, and we put their environment in another slice. And we said, have at it. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't break certain constraints. So they ran their application. It worked just fine. They have Open Vertex, which is their own multi-tenancy solution, which is essentially running inside of ours. And they ran their application that looks like this. And I don't know pr precisely all the details, but essentially they showed this same UI a year ago, and then the whole thing was running in a simulated environment, um, sort of showing the campuses on the edges there and the network in the middle. And um, so basically what they did this year is the center part was actually our switches. And so they were using a slice on our switches to do their experiment and demonstrate their results. And I'm sure there's you know, a dozen other people in this room who have a different idea for a controller and would like to do the same thing. Um, you'll even notice if you're sharp-eyed that there's a, they didn't like the fact that we had a ring and they added a link from LA to Chicago in their virtual topology, which they could do. Um, we also had a live network event with a backhoe in Arizona and our infrastructure worked fine and theirs worked fine as well. So it was a good first step sort of showing that this is possible and that it's ready. So where are we at today from a Genie perspective? It is 100 gig, it's got an SDN substrate. You can reach it from campuses either via ION um, or a direct connection into AL2S. It's connected to the Genie mesoscale, although we basically want to replicate and replace the functionality of the Genie mesoscale, and it does have an aggregate manager. You know, for the ION service, which still exists as long as people are connected to it, is built as an MPLS overlay on top of our layer three service, which runs over our layer two, which runs over OpenFlow. So it's really the same thing, so it's a little silly, but um, it's still there. You can use it, supports Genie stitching, and it has the max aggregate manager. The layer two service is our purely OpenFlow circuit service. Um, you can create it through multiple UIs, as I said, and it has a foam-based um, aggregate manager as well. It does not yet support dynamic stitching, but it, that is in progress, and I'll talk about that in a second. So from a Genie perspective, we're ready to go with flow space firewall. So why, do, why aren't I up here deploying it and telling you it's all ready? Um, well, um, we're still in the middle of our policy and process discussions, and I'll lay that out. That's not really the roadblock. Um, the other issue is that apparently um, people use IPv6, and we're not supposed to break it for the whole country. Um, and so we are currently um, working on that. Uh, and for those of you who wonder how much IPv6 load we have, it's, it's about 5% of production traffic. Um, Luke and I did a back of the envelope this morning. We think that's about right. Um, so policy and process, what's that going to look like? Um, you know, but basically this is sort of an early roadmap of what, of what we're going to do. So let's say you, you, you listen to this talk, you get to the end and you say, I've got an idea for a new controller and I want to run on the national network. Um, so, so the first question we're going to ask you is we're going to say, well, what do you want to do specifically? You know, what, what does your application do? Talk us through it so we understand roughly. Because remember, we're not just concerned about you. We're also concerned about our flow space firewall. So in the early days, we're going to be very careful and try to make sure that we really did protect ourselves adequately. You know, there's going to be some constraints on your VLAN range, the number of flow rules, the rate of flow rule insertion, the rate of packet in, packet out events, et cetera. Um, so we'll talk through that. We're going to run it on the iDream Genie test lab infrastructure, which basically duplicates AL2S with a smaller number of nodes in a lab in Bloomington. We're going to run it on NDDI, which is where we ran that um, Onos demo. And then we're going to try to roll it out on AL2S. So we got to refine that a little bit, but that's the basic plan. Um, so where are we at on deploying network virtualization? Well, originally, as in January, we were just going to deploy it and it was going to support layer two and layer three matching. Um, but as I mentioned, we also realized that we need to support IPv6, and so a vendor solution that breaks IPv6 but supports layer 2-3 matching is not okay. Um, and so we've been talking with the GPO about three approaches going forward. Um, and I would sort of characterize them as a slow roll, a single vendor, or a limited matching approach. Um, the slow roll approach is basically we may get the vendor fixed fast enough that no one will notice. Um, and, and we think the testing process will take a couple of months to go through, so let's just start working with people who want to do it, um, and then hopefully AL2S will be ready by the time they're ready. The second approach would be a single vendor approach, uh, where we try to basically make one of the two vendors in the network vanish from the perspective of virtualization, which we think we can do, but it does add a lot of complication to our implementation. And the third approach is a limited matching approach where we basically roll out with support for layer two matching only. 
Um, so I think, based on our conversations with the GPO, but I'd be happy to hear from folks here today that um, the single vendor solution is probably not the right one and that um, rolling it out with support for layer two matching only would probably be useful at least in the early days and then upgrading that to layer two, three. But if folks feel like that's not particularly useful, we'd be happy to talk to you offline about that later today. Um, and, and so some combination of that limited matching and that slow roll uh, we think is really the right way to probably go forward. Um, so basically we're ready to entertain the first few requests. We showed one last week. We'd like to start understanding who wants to be able to do this and start talking with you. And we think we'll have it ready for you um, as we work through the testing process to go forward. Um, one other quick thing before I break. Um, uh, the other thing that folks may be wondering from a Genie perspective is what about our support for dynamic stitching? So we have FOMA, the aggregate manager deployed. We've been doing some talking with Tom and others about dynamic stitching. Um, we haven't made as much progress as we'd hoped by the just GEC, but we're pretty close. Um, specifically, we, we've, noted, we've identified one issue that we weren't supporting correctly in OESS to allow, enable dynamic stitching, support for remote link IDs, which we will get fixed in the next version of OESS. And we have to do a little bit more work on foam, the implementation that we have to respond to stitching requests from our specs. But we expect delivery before the next GEC on that. Um, I think that's probably enough. So hopefully, uh, we believe this will create an environment for innovation going forward. I know it's not the only defini definition of network virtualization, um, but we hope, hopefully it's one that folks can live with that um, you know, allows them to do what they really want to do while still allow, you know, having the opportunity to be directly putting rules into the switches on the national network alongside of our production traffic in a safe way. And that's it. So folks are welcome to grab me offline um, or in this afternoon session and talk through the issues on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, appreciate the update. You may want to pass your microphone on uh, to uh, Chip, who I think will be getting up in very quickly. So for those of you who recall that I said we left about half of our time uh, for this segment, you will realize that we're going to eat into our break a little bit, but we will, we will try to accelerate this um, somewhat. But this is a, a very important uh, demo that I think is going to give us a bit of a glimpse of what we can do with the kind of infrastructure uh, that Eric was just describing. When we get the opportunity to really uh, work in uh, a, a wide area software-defined network and reach across multiple domains. So that's the basic topic here. Anybody who's been hanging around Genie for a little while understands that we are actively deploying a multi-domain software-defined networking federation that is I believe the biggest uh, research multi-domain uh, SDN federation there is. We're at you know, about 50 sites, each of which has local owners, local operators, and retains a level of control over its own SDN domain. So you know, how do we work with that? What's the potential? How do we manage the control? This is exactly the kind of question that comes up when we start talking about software-defined exchanges. Now, Genie researchers are not the only people who have been thinking about SDXs, but we have been thinking about them for a little while because this is a problem that pops up right away when you start thinking about building real Genie. And it just gets magnified, additional fold, when we start thinking about international federation and collaborating with uh, our other peer projects, both, you know, both nationally and internationally. We have three projects that have just recently gotten underway in Genie, specifically uh, thinking about some of these issues, and you will see some of their work uh, demonstrated today. Now this is very early stuff. Okay. 
we have not implemented fully functional software-defined networking exchanges. In fact, nobody's completely clear even on what the key functions of an SDX are. But we think that it's important to start looking at these questions, to start understanding what the naughty problems are, and to start making the mistakes now because we better make them now rather than making them later. So you may want to think of these as analogs to existing concepts in the current internet or in the developing internet. You may not want to think of them that way. I think uh, when Chip and Larry get up and talk a little bit about the implications of this infrastructure, it'll give you some options for how to think about it. But what you're going to see now is you know, a little bit of an introduction to what a software-defined networking exchange is, what that implies for software-defined infrastructure in the future, and then a specific application in uh, weather forecasting. This goes, I mean, Genie is thinking about these problems, but the potential impact goes way beyond Genie. So this is a you know, real glimpse into the future. Thanks, Mark. I'm Chip Elliott, uh, and I'm here uh, kind of on behalf of a lot of people in the audience and a lot of people who are elsewhere. So I'm the front man uh, for this. I'm, um, um, I'd like to step back and kind of talk about the bigger picture of what's going on here. Genie is getting to this notion of kind of sliced, virtualized, end-to-end -end infrastructure. Um, the grid is getting there. The glyph is getting there. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, obviously the cloud world is getting there. Uh, the telcos are getting there with network functions virtualization. So a whole bunch of us are all going in exactly the same direction. And I think it's happening uh, surprisingly fast. You know, we talk, I, I think of this as the horseless carriage <laughs> analogy. We talk about virtual machines. So we started with machines, then we built virtual machines, then we built multi-tenant data centers out of virtual machines. We're doing this kind of stuff in Genie end to end across many administrative domains. But at some point, we'll stop thinking of these as virtual machines. That's kind of irrelevant. What we're really talking about is software-defined infrastructure running services end to end. The fact that there's a lot of computation and storage in it, well, of course there is. Recently, I've been kind of looking into how would we build next generation racks in particular. Uh, and it's pretty interesting what's going on in, in the hardware world. At present, um, it's pretty easy for us to support, you know, thousands of slices in a rack. Now, Genie buys rather cheap racks, so we can't support thousands of slices. But a, a, reasonable, a reasonable quality rack can give computation and storage end to end for thousands of slices at every place in the network. One of the conclusions I draw from this is if, if, you know, if we wind the clock back when we were doing the ARPANET and the Internet, if we were doing it today, we would never invent the router. We have computation, storage in abundance everywhere. We would not develop specialized router equipment in this world. I, I think that's the world we're going to. Things are starting to dissolve back into comp oops, computation and storage. Um, a number of people have been talking recently about looking beyond Genie. How are we going to start interconnecting all these SDNs around? And how are we going to turn it from being just a networking thing into compute, storage, and networking everywhere? Ubiquitous, end-to-end, multi-domain, software-defined infrastructure. And I think, uh, I think there's a consensus, or maybe consensus is too strong a word. There's a lot of people beginning to say, the best way to move forward, the best next step, is to start creating and you know, build and use software-defined exchanges. These will interconnect these islands that exist and kind of allow end-to-end -end service. Now, if you're in Genie, you say, well, that, you know, that's, that's what we've been thinking about and doing for low these many years, and I agree. But this thing is considerably bigger than Genie, right? Now we're starting to talk about the 
real next generation infrastructure that's coming. Um, I'm a particular fan of standing up SDXs, software defined exchange, um, to let people connect into because it's a focal point for a community. None of us really know what these things are, but we're all heading in that direction. This will be a place where we can kind of meet, have plug fests, design things, work together, and so on. This is the way the internet first organized itself, is a bunch of open peering points, and I think that's great for growing the community. After some time, this may revert into a series of private peerings, as the internet did. But at the beginning, I don't think we want that. I think we want this to be very, very open, so we can kind of engage people, get as many ideas as possible, and figure out how this whole thing is going to work. Uh, in December, a number of the people in this room uh, were actually in a two-day workshop in Washington that was convened by um, OSTP out of the White House, uh, NSF, DOE, um, and the NIDRD community. Inder Manga, who, who was here, he's probably here somewhere today, um, was the PI of this, so he led the workshop. And there were about 100 people in the room, of whom I say, you know, many, many are here today, trying to thrash out, hey, what are the concrete next steps we should take in this space? So the, the report is still in progress. You know, there's kind of no definitive report that I can point you to. Um, but basically, a lot of people are converging on this idea that, you know, we use the word SDN a lot now, but really what we're talking about is compute, storage, networking, all three. And Eric was raising that at the end of his talk, right? Kind of the next thing on the checklist is compute and storage as well as the network. Uh, you know, clearly people think as this begins to happen, this is going to be a huge thing, um, changing the internet. And one of the most interesting things, the thing that you're going to see in this demo, is you can think of kind of creating infrastructure on demand for specific applications or scientific instruments. Right, so you just kind of whip up the appropriate infrastructure um, for these app, apps and uh, instruments. Again, in the, the workshop, the conclusion came, well, now is the time. You know, none of us quite know what this is, but this is the time to do it. Probably the best way to proceed, the next step, is to start creating these software-defined exchanges and do it with industry and with key app developers, app users, and so on. And of course, everybody thinks in the end, somehow this should be secure when we're all done. Okay, so with that as kind of background, you know, what you're about to see, it's a genie thing, but you're about to see kind of a conceptual demo of SDXs in operation. Right, this, these are not real SDXs. You know, these are kind of today's Rev Zero version, but it's to give you an idea of what does this architecture look like? What would you do with it? And uh, Mike Zink will be demonstrating a next generation app running across this software defined infrastructure. But I want to remind you, this, you know, these, these things don't yet really exist. So this is kind of a conceptual demo. Okay, thanks. Okay, hi everyone. So, uh, as uh, Chip said, this is a demo today. So, I am just he up here just to talk a little bit about exactly what are the pieces that we put together in order uh, for Mike to be able to run his application and, and run this demo. So, Mark, I, when he came up, he talked about Gini being probably the largest uh, multi domain SDN uh, test that, that is out there, and we have all these different uh, all, all these different domains that have software-defined networking that are interconnected in order to be able to build slices, right? So what do we do? So Mike has an interesting idea about a few, uh, next generation application that you want to test on, to on top of uh, an SDX uh, setup. 
So he has, uh, it's, uh, he will talk about more, but it's about short-term weather forecasting, which has like time critical uh, information that needs to go across, uh, across the network fast. So we built him a slice, right, and deployed it on a, on a Gini slice. And before I go into the details of each of the pieces we used in order to, de to deploy this, I just want to give you like a conceptual diagram of exactly what you're gonna see uh, in a minute when Mike comes up. So we have uh, the radar traffic, the simulated radar traffic uh, coming in in, uh, in Northwestern, and that will go uh, through an, an SDX or an SDX-like capability running in Starlight through, dif through different domains, so Internet2, ESnet, and, uh, and Oak Ridge. And that will uh, arrive here at the, the SDX running here at SOX uh, in Atlanta. And from there, it will go to the Georgia Tech rack and it will come here to the demo floor to, in order to see the results. So how did we go about bu building this and what are all the components that are involved in this uh, demo? So we have uh, our end hosts. We have the simulated uh, radars that are running in the Northwestern rack uh, yeah. in Chicago. And we have uh, the end hosts that are here in the Georgia Tech that actually display the, the results uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of, the now, of the forecasting, of the weather forecasting. And of course, we need to connect this uh, to end hosts. So we started by using the Gini Backbone as uh, one option that goes over the AL2S uh, Internet 2 network. But we needed more diversity in the paths uh, in the path that we're going to be used for this demo. So we asked help and we provisioned two more. Uh, we added two more SDN domains uh, in this mix. So we have one more path going over uh, ESnet and one more path going over uh, Oak Ridge. And if you see here at the places at Starlight at SOX, you have diff five different uh, domains connecting in one place. They're appearing uh, in one open flow switch over there. And uh, so these are the natural place where you're going to deploy this uh, primary SDX capability in order to test the capabilities and see how you can benefit, how can an application benefit from this peering of multiple domains uh, in one point and exposing uh, this uh, capability to the application and to the experimenter. Now also this is uh, when you are to deploy this next generation application for reality, you will have all this high stream uh, data coming from the radars and they will come, you know, they will come in one place where all the processing will need to happen and we want this processing to be as close to the backbone as possible. So this is what Chip was talking about, about putting the processing deep in the network. So where you have the high bandwidth links, you can also put your processing and your storage there to do the processing of all the radars uh, coming in before they're actually displayed at the, the end host. So. All the resource reservation happened with uh, Gini standard tools. So all the compute resources, the open flow resources that we, uh, that we reserved here. Within AL2S, we use standard teaching type of tools in order to do the circuit reservation. Eric talked in details about exactly where we stand with integrating AL2S uh, with the rest of uh, the standard Gini tools we're, we're using. So there were a few pieces that were still manual, but there is a, a process moving forward about how we can integrate this uh, end to end. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about where does the SDN control, where is the control, uh, the open flow control stands for this uh, demo. So you see that we have all these different SDN domains all interconnecting and there are different places where we can actually exert control over our traffic. Uh, for the domains that are in the middle that are providing the traffic, we didn't try, that are providing transit, we didn't try to affect their forwarding policies. So this is whatever uh, default they're doing. I think Eric talked in detail about how this can be open uh, to, to experimenters, but as of now, they are running their own forwarding policies within uh, their own uh, networks. So now for the places that Mike can control, uh, there is a load balancer controller running in the SDXs in order to take advantage of all the different uh, paths that are available to him over the three different uh, SDN domains. And there is also a learning uh, controller running in order uh, to, to manage the rest of the SDN uh, resources that he has in his slice. I, I just want to make clear that this was just a decision made for the specific demo. This was not uh, necessary that he had to make this choice. He could have deployed 
distributed controllers, dis uh, control every single domain with a separate controller. He could have only one centralized controller. These are all things that we're still experimenting on. We still don't understand what is uh, a better choice. I know that all these things, you know, they're small clouds there and they seem, you know, like small things, but I just want to point out with the uh, pointing out here as with using Starlight as just an example that all these small clouds with the one node, there are actually a lot of work that went behind it in order uh, to engineer this and interconnect all uh, these domains together. So as a summary, what is the demo configuration that you're going to see today? So this is a, a demo that runs on multi-domain SDN uh, Gini Slice. There are two experiment and run open flow controllers that are involved in this demo. You will see the dynamic uh, path switching that will be controlled by the application in this case, by uh, the Nowcast application. And you're also going to see the network processing that will happen right at the SDX. Uh, of course, this demo wasn't you know, easy to put together. And there are many, many people that I would like to thank for helping us in putting this together. So first of all, our hosts that are not only they had to organize the GEC, but they also support us very much in actually putting this together. The people from Starnight, people from ESNet, uh, everyone at GPO that uh, helped, you know, configure the network, Internet2. And I, I want for all the people that are in the room that helped put, putting this demo together to just stand up, just thank them all together. Thanks, Nikki. I think this is a first where I get thanked for a demo, not even showing it and not even seen, having shown that this actually works. So, um, you know, you know how this is with demos. Keep your fingers crossed. Um. I also want to make sure, since the thank you slide is already up there, um, you know, all the blame for the things not working, should things not work, go to me. Um, you know, I had this crazy idea. A little bit to Chip, he was helping me scheme here. Um, but um, a lot of thank you to all the people who did all the hard work here. This was amazing. A couple of crazy two weeks, but a lot of fun. So my name is Mike Zink. I'm a professor in the Electric and Computer Engineering Department at UMass Amherst. I'm also a co-director for the engineer, NSF Engineering Research Center for Collaborative Adaptive Sensing of the Atmosphere. And I want to start with a little story for you guys. So on May 24th, 2011, if you watch documentaries about severe weather, this would be the story how it goes. It was a wonderful and clear warm morning in southwestern Oklahoma, right? And you know how this all goes. There's a low, uh, there's a high with right nice cold air up over the Rockies, and there's a low that pushes very nice moist warm, warm air from the Gulf of Mexico into the southern plains. Tornado day. So on May 24th, what happened is actually um, we have a radar network out there, and we observe that tornado. And what you see here is actually the path of that tornado in, in green. And one of an, an emergency manager of the town in Newcastle was actually observing that tornado. And he, got, he has two feeds. He has the current system, the National Weather Service next road system, and he has data from our system. He's looking at this data, and based on the path, he's making his mental pred prediction, what you see on the white arrow there. With the existing system, which looks up pretty high and gives updates every five minutes, and I'll give you some details in a moment, um, he didn't see that this tornado all of a sudden made a much quicker move to the north. And so if you look at these two this black dots that are up there, uh, one black dot is actually where he had some of his emergency management crew in the way, right in the path, and thanks to our data, he could move them other way. And then the, the, the dot that's almost at the top of the uh, slide is actually um, where there's a tornado shelter and other people were gathering outside because it was, you know, not, not serious anymore and he could, you know, um, you know, call the folks and get them all inside. Now think of it, this is like, these distances were far enough to have, to, for him to have enough lead time to get the people in safety. Imagine this term would have happened a little bit later, you know, and so what we like, in, what we like to do is actually, or what we're working on is can we actually put out short-term forecasts, we call them nowcasts, that give people more lead time to this, right? You know, average lead time for a tornado these days is 12 minutes, statistically, so it's not much time. So if you can buy five, 10 minutes, that helps a lot. So um, that's kind of this, the, the example I want to give you for what we're doing here. So what's the, what's the problem these days? And I want to focus 
for the uh, two graphs on uh, two images on your right, um, which are showing the um, weather surveillance in the United States. Up at three kilometers, we have pretty good coverage, especially in the eastern United States. If you look at the bottom right one, at one kilometer, it's getting pretty sparse, right? So we have widely spaced radars with um, low altitude coverage gaps. And you know, from everyone, all of you on planes all the time, right? We know that a lot of weather is happening close to the ground. And we want to observe what's close to the ground because that's the weather that really impacts us, right? So actually interesting piece is that this is also the same for aircraft surveillance. Let's, let's stay with the weather. Why is that? Well, you know, I'm actually becoming kind of famous for that. I actually said that once on national public radio, the Earth is round, and I'm 99.99% sure that's this the, that this is the case, right? So if you have a radar that looks 240 kilometers out with relatively a straight beam, as shown in this graph here, you overshoot quite a bit of the atmosphere, right? This results that approximately 72% of the atmosphere below one kilometer up are not observed in this country. We have a really good system. We have the top system for weather observations in the world, but it has its shortcomings. So what we uh, set on in our engine, whoops, so uh, our task in our engineering research center was to overcome that problem and to build systems that can observe the atmosphere much, much, much lower with smaller radars that look closer to the ground, that oper operate in a collaborative uh, affair, so we net uh, uh, version, so we network them together, and you get much better data. Since we're getting close to the break, I thought I'd put a little bit of eye candy on here. So this is a tornado we observed. This is actually from the 2011 tornado I just described. And what you see here is actually the nice rotation um, of the reflectivity. So the rain that gets sucked into that uh, rotation of the tornado. And um, there's actually a picture of that tornado that someone took at, at this day. Um, to give you an update, or to give you a little bit of an impression, what we have here is actually um, a comparison between the data on the left is from our network, and the data on the right is from an expert radar. So to give you a little bit of an impression about how much more fine scale that data is. The update times, you see it's not 100% synchronized, but you see new frames coming in on the left-hand side much faster than on the right-hand side. Um, and actually, what I want to point out, this is, was, was re really a unique occasion for us. Um, can I point with the mouse here? You see on top here, the circulation building up here. That's such the tornado I showed you a little bit uh, blown up. But actually, there's a second one building down here. And you will actually see, if you look very carefully, you see this rotation also on the next red radar. But on the next red radar, we have done this, we have really analyzed locations, right? They're looking up a kilometer, two kilometers, even higher. They don't exactly know where this tornado is touching the ground. And with smaller tornadoes, they, just, they sometimes don't see it at all where we can pick this up. Now again, this is all in real time. What we are looking into pushing this to the next step is actually having short-term forecasts. So in, in increasing the warning lead time for severe weather to really save lives and property. And that is um, up to 30 minutes. Uh, we can do this relatively well with up to 15 minutes and trying to push this even further out. It's based on an algorithm that has been developed by our partners in CASA from Colorado State. Um, it's the Dynamic Adaptive Radar Tracking of Storms System, DARTS. Um, and I want to make sure that you understand this is really very, very different to the full-blown full forecast models. We like to have good computation, but we don't need any supercomputers for that. We can do this right now with a bare metal InstaGenie um, box, right? Now, this is for four radars. That's a different question when you go up to highest, larger scale. So just a little bit of the inner workings, right? Ideally, we have a dynamically provisioned SDN, so we get the network resources we want. And then on the Nowcast VM here, we run a grid and merge because we comes data coming in from several radars, right? We have to grid that. We have to merge that data. We run the uh, Nowcast algorithm, and then we um, do some post-processing and make this available on the web server to the public. And this is happening every one minute. Coming back to the SD axis, um, you've seen that slide, Nikki has shown that slide before. This is our basic setup. What blows me actually away is we, we really did this in one slice, right? You know, that was cool. And um, sorry for taking the logos away, but I needed more space, so please don't be offended, folks who helped us out with that. We had several open flow controls just for simplicity. I'm showing how this is, controls the different um, SDN switches. And then we use um, you know, our tools, including LabWiki, to monitor the outgoing flows on this to actually observe also what's going on on the network side. And we will show that live in a moment. If you're ready, you can actually switch over to that. Um, and so we can actually measure the traffic. And 
as, as Nikki mentioned, this is a demo. So what we're doing here is actually we just switch over between one path where we, where we send all the radar streams um, over um, um, or, or ORNL, and then over to another path where we actually split and do a little bit of load balancing and send data from two radars over ESnet and the, the data from the other two radars over I2. Very simple approach. Now you can actually think about a ton of uh, ways how you can manage that. Eric just said, you know, on a cloudy day, you want to send the data maybe this way or the other way. Yes, that's what we want to do. There might be redundancy issues. There might be, you know, when you have severe weather, path, parts of your path might be not operational. There might be high impairments. There might be other traffic. So that's kind of, you know, let your fantasy play that these scenarios out. These are the opportunities uh, we are working on. So, um, yeah, this is switching back and forth all the time. So what we see here, let me walk a little bit over here because so I can see that I don't have this on here. We're visualizing here the um, data, and so you can actually see the orange graph is actually the ORNL path where all the four radar data are going over on pass for, I, I think, apparently uh, actually one minute. And then after one minute, we switch over to the to, um, disjoint passes over ESnet and I2. And this is the, the blue and the green, and you see actually how you have this going on for one minute over one path, this goes down to zero, and the two path, other two paths come up. So we switch that you know, seamlessly, uh, perfectly back and forth. Um, we've run this many, many times. It has no impact on our application. It's just, just wonderfully working in this case. OK, can you switch over to the Nowcast? Are we getting any data? So actually here, if you can zoom, zoom that up a little bit. So this is, this is the most tricky part in this demo, because it's a demo. And we want to show you that in real time. I'm talking about fast developing weather. But fast developing weather is really not super fast, right? So, so it takes you know, several minutes until, see, until you see update, updates. Um, based on that, we want to go into the break. I don't want to keep you too long. We might be happy to see how, this, how, this, how these a little developing cells here actually um, improve. And when you look really carefully, and I'd be happy to show, to show you this in more detail over the break, you see actually that these are one minute, five minute, and 10 minute forecasts. So you see actually, we have this on top of a map that they change slightly, right? You have them in different locations over time. So these are the forecast where this weather will be in 10 minutes. That's, that's a really important thing um, for uh, you know, people who are, you know, for forecasters, emergency managers, and the public in general, because then they can take the right actions um, to deal with this information. This is calculated right, right now, so take, uh, just recap the scenario. We have the data coming in over the SDXs, switching the path. It's coming into the Nowcast box, which is a VM here in the SOX in Sogini rag. It's calculating that we place that box right next to the high bandwidth connections because then we have the processing right next to the high bandwidth, which is cool. And then we can actually put it out to a web server where it's open to the public. Two more slides and then I got go off here. Just in February, a month ago, we installed a, another new radar in our test bed in Dallas Fort Worth area. We have four radars in that area right now. We're extending that to eight radars. So you know, having more network capacity and dynamic provision of network capacity is something important for us. We would love to be someone who can contribute important time critical data um, to SDXs. If you're interested in that, please come and talk to me. With that, I would like to hand over to, where's Larry? Larry Landweber, who is going to wrap up this session. Um, what should I say about you? He's a genie futurist. He's well known in the area and in our community and in the area probably and um, is a member of the Internet Hall of Fame. Larry, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and, uh, okay, and next time I talk, I'll bring my x-rays. It's a bike accident, the reason I'm limping. Okay, so I'm going to, let's see, I have a talk somewhere but I'm going to skip most of it. And I decided randomly just to do my odd slides as a way of uh, getting you to the break. OK, so I believe we're at an inflection point. We're at a point where things are poised to change dramatically. I've lived through at least three inflection points in networking, packet switching. Almost none of you remember a world without packet switching. Uh, I've lived through the World Wide Web. Very few of you remember the world before the World Wide Web. And we've lived through the, uh, the advent of uh, widespread mobile wireless uh, networking. And more of you remember that. Um, 
The inflection point I think we're at is the beginning of the end of the internet. And um, one phrase I would suggest is that the internet is not forever, okay? The internet is not forever. In 10 to 20 years, at a meeting like this, 20 years, people will not remember the internet. Hard to think of that way when you're in the middle of a widespread paradigm, but very, very few of you have uh, lived in a world before there was commercial aviation. And, you know, the world changes. Okay, so um, let me see. How do I blow this up so that I can see it? Um, oh, well, I'll, I'll just talk. Um, okay, so uh, where, what, what are the elements of this uh, new paradigm that I think we're entering? We, as Chip and Mark and uh, Eric mentioned, we're in a world where we have programmable resources Everything is programmable. Uh, compute, storage, networking, switching, uh, soon refrigerators, appliances. We also have virtualization, uh, although I defy anybody to suggest a model for the virtual refrigerator, but that's a separate issue. But So we have virtualization together with programmable resources, and we have all of these new uh, technologies that have come of age over the last few years that are being somehow converged with this notion of programmability, virtualization, distribution, um, SDN. Uh, by the way, one of the things, problems I have with SDN is I really hate giving talks about undefined terms. And uh, it would be nice if there were really, a, if there were a, a real definition of that term so that one could not speak about just about anything and say this is SDN. Okay, so we have, we have SDN, we have multi-tenant data centers, we have network functions virtualization, we have cyber physical systems as Mike has just demoed, we have uh, mobility, and soon the Internet of Things. All of these embody the same concepts, programmability of a diverse collection of resources, multi-domain, virtualization. Okay, so I want to uh, hazard a, uh, by the way, there must be a way to blow this up. The space bar. Yeah? No? I don't want to go to the next slide. I want to blow it up so I can read it. Can't do that. Okay. Well, back to here. Okay. So, um, so what's the definition of SDI? Uh, SDI, um, these programmable, network-connected, virtualizable resources, and the technologies they enable. Okay? Everybody can disagree with that. That's the definition I'm using as my working definition. And I believe this definition and this uh, notion of SDI will allow, enable a whole new collection of applications that we have not yet envisioned. Hardly anybody envisioned the World Wide Web before it happened, okay? So we don't know what's going to, what this is going to lead to. Now, I'm going to skip that slide and go to this one. Um, this is a slide for which tells, is my view of how we're going to get there. So we're starting with SDN, which today is really just open flow. Yes? There's a, there's a big slide. OK, now how do I, I should have brought my own computer. That's going backwards. That's going forwards. Ah, is it up there now? Okay. Nah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so here's how we're going to proceed. We have SDN now. Once we understand what SDN really is, uh, mostly it's open flow these days. But we have a general notion of what open flow is. Uh, we are moving to a world where we want to define multi-domain software-defined networks, and we have this notion of software-defined exchanges. Uh, my suggestion is that uh, what we have up to now is a phase zero, although Joe uh, was really not happy with phase zero, and he wanted me to make it a phase uh, 0.1 SDX. So we have 0.1 SDXs, and we need to get to SDXs which legitimately 
act as intermediate points for the connection of software-defined networks. Um, the term that I've been using for myself is uh, meta-controller. That is a, um, essentially an, a, an open flow or me SDN controller that knows about flow space and policy issues on either side of um, the thing for the things connected to it, the networks connected to it, and then mediates uh, at the boundary. I think we'll be there within another year or so, or two years at the most. Then that's what I call phase one SDX. Now, then we want to move to SDI, where we're talking about this generalized set of resources. And we need a uh, SDX which is much more interesting. We need an SDX that knows about the availability and policy issues related to resources on either side for the administrative domains on either side of the SDX or all of the connected administrative domains. I, for this, I've been using the term meta clearinghouse because I think the notion of a genie clearinghouse gets us a long way to this, but there's more involved with policy issues. I hope all of this doesn't turn out to be the same kind of quagmire as with BGP. Uh, although one good side effect would be a lot of PhD theses, but never mind, uh, forget that one. Um, anyway, uh, I think that will be the next stage, and that's where it gets very inter really interesting. I'm going to skip the next slide if I can. Let's see, and skip that one, and we will go to the. This is my last slide. So what's, what's the action item? The action item is stand up and uh, operate multiple SDXs, it, learn what they're all about. Um, there's research here. We don't know how to do this. I mean, we still don't really know how to do BGP. So uh, I disagree with Chip a bit or a lot because I think there's still going to be routing involved because you've got to get stuff from one place to another through different administrative domains. And I call that routing, OK? Because I don't think we'll have, we, we don't have enough in the way of a one world uh, network. And we're, never, we're probably never going to get that. OK, we have to engage all the communities. We have, we're going to have a bunch of workshops to start talking about this. We're already talking about workshops in Washington, maybe later, later this spring and summer, as soon as the snow goes away. Um, we need you to be interested in this and to participate. And uh, we need our, all of our national fundraising, um, not fundraising, although they are, all of our national funding agencies to uh, be interested in helping to support this as they have supported all the activities up to now. So if you want to remember one phrase from this talk, remember the internet is not forever, OK? Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody who put this demo together. I hope you all enjoyed uh, a glimpse into the future of software-defined networking, SDXs, and software-defined infrastructure. And I'm getting a signal from the back. Yes, Russ? Okay, lunch from 11 to 2. Please help load balance. You do not need to go at the time listed in the schedule. Thank you all for your patience. Let's have a break. <laughs>